Okay, so thanks for having me, Matt. Uh, thanks everybody for joining. I want to talk a little bit about Open Road and really updates of uh, what's been going on since pretty much over the past year I'll talk about, but I'll focus maybe more on the past six months. I just wanted to say I'm Tom Spiro. I'm presenting. I'm the chief architect of Open Road and a UCSD visiting scholar as part of the DARPA program. Matt Liberty will follow me in this session and give a demo and answer detailed questions. So thanks. So I think the first thing is, why are we here? Why did DARPA fund this program? Why are we trying to do open road? So I think if you look at how ASIC design is done today, everybody knows that they are very sophisticated proprietary tools with thousands of commands. And the focus of the tool suppliers is to maximize performance, power, and area. That sounds like a good thing, but the focus of the tools and the usability and the commands is all around that. Whereas with Open Road, we really want to have the main focus be on automation, but also have reasonable power performance and area. So it sounds subtle, but it's actually a big difference in focus for the tool. So today's ASIC teams need large teams of expert users uh, with many manual steps involved. There's long project schedules and significant project risks. So the goal of Open Road is no humans, 24 hours. And again, the focus is to maximize ease of use and runtime and to directly attack the crisis of design and innovation. And that crisis is that it's just getting more and more expensive to design chips. And so there are lots of chips that people would want to design, but that are not getting designed. Perhaps they leave it in software, perhaps they do it with an FPGA, whatever it might be. So there's a schedule barrier that we're addressing with RTL to GDS in 24 hours, an expertise barrier, no human in the loop for tape out quality GDS, and a cost barrier. The tool is open source and with all the good work that Tim is doing, you know, there are open source PDKs coming online and it runs in 24 hours. So what we want to do is unleash system innovation, let people design those chips that they're blocked from shipping, uh, shipping today. And if you were, paid attention during Tim's talk, that's a main focus that he talked about as well, that I think he said 60%, I thought that was the number I heard of people are doing, have not done chips before. And that's what we're after, unleash innovation. Make it so that if you have a great idea, you can design a chip in your garage, just like you can write a software program in your garage. So I think looking at Open Road version 2.0, uh, version 2.0 came out probably in July or August, and I'm talking mostly about what's in there and a little bit beyond. You know, the new features that we've added is an early SOC planner. So if you do want to look at your floor plan or somehow be manually involved with that, you can. Also, we're working on improving the macro placer and making sure that the fully automatic floor plan has even better results. The next thing that we added is also parasitic extraction and using that for timing sign-off. And that's really important. Previous to having the open RCX extractor, the timing analysis that was done in open road was done with placement-based parasitics. And those are great estimates, but as you get to lower and lower technology nodes, you really need to know what layer the wires are on to do a good timing estimation. So we're very excited about that. Uh, usability, we have a document on how to bring up tool on a new technology. We're making it easier to bring up a tool on a new technology. Uh, we've improved the messages and documentation a lot, um, enhanced user GUI. Um, we've also focused a lot you know, on power performance and area. Like I mentioned, our initial goal was automation at all costs, DRC correctness every time, all the time. And so now that we've gotten over that hurdle for the most part, as Tim said, with any software system, there's always some tweaking and tuning that has to be done. But so we are now turning our attention to PPA. So here, initially, we've been focused on logic synthesis, placement, clock tree synthesis, and timing optimization. So for a lot of our benchmarks now, if you compare you know, our version 2.0, the designs are coming out 30% faster and 20% denser than in version 1.0. So that's basically a whole technology node of improvement. 
The next thing too is that we're moving forward on what we call the true no human in the loop flow or auto tuner, which uses machine learning to launch multiple runs of open road with various parameters. For those who are familiar, it's using hyperparameter tuning in order to do lots of runs of open road to come up with the best PPA. So we're really excited about what we've been doing with version 2.0. I think we've probably talked about it enough that in Sky 130 through eFabulous on the Google sponsored shuttle, there's been more than 100 tape outs. eFabulous has their Chip Ignite shuttle. We also do support some closed source PDKs. You know, you have to talk to the foundry if you want access to those, but for the ones that we do support, if you get access to those foundry PDKs, you can use them with Open Road. So in GF12, there was a mixed signal tape out that was done that I'll talk a little more about. In Intel 22, there's work on an AI device. So at the moment, we have test cases running on GF12, Intel 22, GF55, TSMC65, Sky90, and Sky130. And we have more nodes on the way. And part of the reason we want to be sure that we support multiple nodes, especially ones like GF12, which are fairly advanced, is one of the goals of Open Road is to document for posterity the right way to architect and build an EDA system. So we don't want to build something that's only good for old nodes. We are very focused on making sure the system can support all of the advanced nodes over time. Tom, could you uh, go into presentation mode on your slides? So oh, I, can fill the screen with them. I wasn't sure what would work better. So does that look better? Yeah, it looks better. OK, sorry. Um, thanks for letting me know about that. So. One thing that we're pretty proud of is we did a, what we call a tape in. We made the manufacturer GDS. We got it all the way through Caliber and the foundry tests. We just didn't have the budget to actually fab it. So we did a 12 nanometer SOC tape in called Black Parrot. We did a version of that with version 1.0 of the software. And using version 2.0, we've been able to see a 36% increase in Fmax, a big improvement in total negative slack. Maximum skew is a lot better, total wire length. So on all parameters, we're really happy with how this is going. This was done in Global Foundry's 12 LP using Invicus IOs and the ARM standard cells and RAMs. <clears throat> the GDS is DRC LVS clean as verified by design advisors using Mentor Caliber. And we were able on this design to go RTL to GDS in less than five hours. So another PPA vector that we're working hard on, and I know there's been a lot of discussion about that. In earlier versions of Open Road, the clock skew was left something to be desired. So by making improvements to how we partition the clock tree and improving an algorithm called sync cluster, newer versions of Open Road have much better clock tree synthesis and much better clock skew, as you can see here. Um, as expected on large designs, you will see a good bit of latency. And so in your timing sign off recipe, you have to be sure to put in proper on chip variation to compensate for the skew that's part of that and have it show up in your skew calculation in your sign off timing report. So here you can see the clock tree. Now the GUI, which uh, Matt will give a demonstration of when I'm done, you can actually visualize the clock tree, make sure that it looks balanced, make sure that uh, especially clock trees leading up to discontinuous things like macros look good. And you can actually view timing reports in the GUI now. So if you see a timing path that is failing hold, for example, you can visualize it in the GUI and figure out what you're going to do about it. Normally, users should not have to intervene in this way, but as we're building up the software and making it better, it might happen that you see a failing timing path and it might be good to look at it. So another thing that I mentioned, the auto tuner, is that we're working hard on synthesis and automatic PPA exploration runs. So at the moment, we have 22 synthesis optimization recipes with seven main configurations, four dedicated to timing, and three dedicated to area reduction. Um, you know, for example, their buffering sizing options include uh, tweaking the max fan out parameter, tweaking your max transition constraints, uh, upsizing and downsizing. The default open road recipe here is shown in red. 
And so what we've basically been doing by running these experiments, we've been changing the default open road recipe, making sure that when you run it out of the box, you can get the best results. And then of course, on top of this, in the future, when we release AutoTuner, you would be able to uh, spawn lots of runs and use machine learning to improve this even further. So for post-synthesis automatic PPA exploration, a lot of work has been done in this area. There's even an ICCAD paper, I think, that's been published about this. So here, what we're trying to do is analyze and improve what we call QOR trajectories. So as Open Road is running from RTL to GDS, at each step of the process, we do analysis based on various cost functions like area, timing, wire length, congestion, et cetera. And so what we're doing with all of these experiments is doing an exploration to figure out where do we set these parameters in order to get the best results. And using machine learning and AutoTuner, we're going to automate these experiments so that if someone brings up a new node or has a design that's a lot different than we've ever done before, these parameters can be automatically tuned as the flow progresses and improve results quite a bit. So as part of our <clears throat> commitment to machine learning and auto tuner, we've standardized the AI metrics for an EDA flow in order to facilitate tool learning. So for example, metrics could be the number of buffers inserted, the total wire length, runtime metrics are kind of more obvious, CPU time used, peak memory used. And all of these metrics can become features for training machines. So one thing that we did is we moved all of the code to use a unified logger with consistent namespaces, consistent information, warning, critical message, nomenclature. And this is essential for continuous PPA improvement. We need to have automatic tests that run. We need to make sure that they're always getting better. And we can use these same parameters to train machines in order to do machine learning runs and improve results. So there's some, you know, the, for each design stage, there's various uh, metrics that we gather, you know, floor planning, global placement, CTS. There's metrics categories, area, congestion, timing. And then of course there's the metric itself, total negative slack, worst negative slack, number of instances, switching power, CPU time, et cetera. And so all of these parameters can be used to train machines and you'll see them in the log file. Uh, so I think here's an example. You probably, if you look at the log file, which you shouldn't have to in a no human in the loop flow, but if you do, you can see these metrics there and they can be parsed by anybody who wants to try to use them to train machines and run open road with machine learning. So we've had a couple of other exciting designs, ones that were not related to 130 nanometer node or eFabulous that I thought it's good to highlight. There's a user who doesn't want to be named, who's done an AI platform and various uh, experiments with different AI tiles in GF55 and GF12. There's University of Michigan. Uh, the FA SOC program has done an open Titan SOC with GF12 LP. And so we're very excited to see all of the good work going on with the open source PDK and also all the work going on with the closed source ones, which hopefully one day will become open source. I think that Tim talked a lot about this, so I won't go into any detail on this, just to mention that we're very excited to work with eFabulous on this. The 100 plus tape outs is just great. And this is where the bulk of our users are. So we have a lot of focus. We're working closely with eFabulous to make sure that this flow is streamlined and works well. We definitely do have a growing user community. I think that uh, this just basically shows a two week random period that I picked. And we had almost 14,000 clones, which I think is great. That means people are downloading the software, kicking the tires. And we know that the different applications people are using it for, uh, root of trust devices, uh, people want to enhance it to do 3D IC, AM, ML. You know, the community metrics are all growing, which we're really happy about. Um, so I think in terms of availability, most of you know that the Open Road project is the area where we're hosting things. Uh, open Lane is the automatic flow developed by eFabulous. And the top level application called Open Road is in the uh, repo at the bottom. And you know, to kick the tires, you can play around with Open Road if you're trying to learn about EDA tools. 
but I believe most users will use Open Road in an automatic flow like OpenLane. So kind of to summarize, you know, in the past year, we've had a lot of breakthroughs. We've had a 12 nanometer tape out. We've proven it's we can do uh, tape outs at 12 nanometer directly from an academic research effort. We have an integrated architecture, the database, the timing engine. So this architecture is built to last. In version 2.0, we've improved PPA a lot. Like I mentioned, the machine learning and auto tuning the 100 tape outs. And we have a lot of engaged contributors, which is great from IBM, Google, eFabulous, and others as well. So I think in terms of, you know, keeping this project to be sustainable, what we're really hoping is that, you know, eventually we want to figure out how do, how does this sustain itself? Either companies like eFabulous building a sustainable business on it, and also having a research ecosystem you know, businesses would productize, distribute support like you see eFab is doing. Hopefully the research ecosystem will innovate and make the tool go faster, make the clock frequency go faster. And then special applications and system needs could also be better served. You know, in terms of growing the technology, uh, machine learning, cloud, I think cloud deployment is really an interesting area for this, for something that's fully automatic. People may not want to go through the trouble of building, installing the software, et cetera. They may prefer to run it in the cloud. So that's something that we're talking about and working on. And of course, we want to grow the user and developer community. That's something that's super important to us. So we are looking for users and developers to join the effort. So if you work for a company that would let you do it, you have an interest, you're a hobbyist, we're really interested to expand those areas. So I think now I will turn it over to Matt for a quick demonstration of Open Road. <laughs> 